Unit 2, Unit 2. Involved in discussions with HMRC or and or the Treasury on this? Yes, um, with HMRC. Um, it's quite a well-rehearsed issue uh, at a fairly uh, recent meeting with them actually talking about Brexit and, and customs duty. They raised the question of import VAT. The problem is at the moment we have uh, acquisition VAT, which means there's no cash flow disadvantage. The tax does not have to be paid. It's effectively self-accounted for. With import VAT, it either has to be paid on import or it has to be paid with a, a guarantee or a, uh, uh, under the deferment scheme uh, the 15th day of the next month. Um, HMRC are looking, I believe, at something called postponed accounting. And postponed accounting is slightly different from the current acquisition tax system, but the result will be the same, that the VAT will not have to be paid up front. One interesting implication of that is that uh, if they were to use a postponed accounting system, it would be discriminatory just to use it to import from the EU, so it would apply to imports more generally. So it would be an advantage for a wider range of traders. So worldwide imports as well? Worldwide, yes, okay. is my understanding. Uh, and my question perhaps to uh, ATT, I'm not sure you have to answer uh, again about conversations that you've been having with HMRC and Treasury on this. In fact, we've not had too many constructive um, discussions with, with HMRC about this. We attend the Joint VAT Consultative Committee along with the other professional bodies. HMRC report that committee regularly, but all they've been able to tell us really generally was what, what, what we've read in the press. You know, they're, they're, in a, you know, they're in a very difficult position themselves, I believe. <laughs> but our concern is, re is really at the moment it's very easy for small businesses to trade with a firm or buy stock from a firm, say, in Germany. It's almost as easy to buy it from Germany as it, it is from Scotland. Absolutely. Yeah. If we have, shall we say, hard Brexit? I don't quite know. But if we, if, if we have more formalities, customs formalities, of course, it will become more difficult to trade mm. with Germany. Or whether that's right or wrong, I, I leave that to you to decide. <laughs> Mr. Allen, is there anything particularly on the EU's or the withdrawal from the EU that you know, uh, imports would concern members of Ravis in relation to mail order, um, because at the moment. VAT isn't even collected on every package coming in from the United States, so how it would be dealt with from Europe would be something we're waiting to find out. Um, so if I could just mention exports are an issue as well, because there's delays the other way. Um. I think particularly well. to look at the, 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 the tax gap and, and obviously where um, that is not being collected uh, at the moment and what people are doing to, uh, to, to get around it. Um, are there any other potential costs or impacts of businesses being outside the EU uh, VAT area that are of particular concern, Mr Lyons? Um, yes, um, there are a number of existing simplification measures um, which it looks very likely that if we are to le leave the single market and the customs union we can't use anymore. About three of those um, prevent UK businesses and supply chains having to register for VAT in other member states. You might have heard about triangulation and call-off stock and consignment stock and supply and install. All of these things could be impacted. Uh, there might be a solution, there might be a quick fix, but at the moment it seems unlikely. So there are some costs there. There are also uh, there's the uh, possibility, very strong chance, of leaving the system where VAT refunds. VAT occurred in other member states where you don't have a VAT registration at the moment can be claimed back through something called the VAT portal via HMRC, so you don't have to uh, translate into different languages. Uh, if we leave the single market, uh, we will lose that as well. And just in terms of business awareness, uh, or perhaps members' uh, awareness, um, you know, what are you finding in terms of the way that or perhaps all of you um, businesses are preparing, or are they not preparing for this, and just hoping that there will be some form of agreement? Ms Wilson? I feel at the moment that businesses know that they need to do something but without solid facts about what the end state is going to look like it's very hard for them to plan um, especially smaller businesses they're so involved in the day-to-day -day of making sure the wage bills get paid that everything comes in on time that having to plan for a contingency and not knowing what that might be even though we are getting near the time is it, it's down the list of priorities at the moment um, and I think until there's a clearer picture of what they need to do especially the smaller end of the scale that they're not going to be able to take concrete steps. Mr. Ryan, would you agree with that? Your, your well, members? I know businesses considering moving its fulfilment hub into an EU location because it could actually be beneficial to supply UK customers from inside the EU if you have these problems with VAT on imports. So, I mean, that was certainly what happened when the Channel Islands became a big issue. 
people started relocating outside of the EU in order to re remain competitive. So my concern would be that that repeats itself. I think there's a, there is a very clear difference, and Emma made this quite clear, between larger and smaller businesses. Yeah. Uh, larger businesses do have the capacity, uh, they've instructed advisors, and most of our clients are working on a sort of prepare for a hard Brexit scenario. Now, on the, um, the joint statement uh, the EU and UK made uh, on the 19th of June, setting out progress in Article 50 negotiations, included some agreed positions on VAT. Um, has that provided any comfort for your clients about the, the use of the transition period? Uh, I think they'd, most clients have already factored in the transition period. They already thought that nothing was going to effectively change until the end of that period. I think one fear is there could be two changes, and nobody wants that. If there is going to be a change, we'd like just one change rather than a number of different changes. So, so I think it was good news, but I think most clients were unsurprised by it. And the move of the fulfilment hubs, is that, would that be the main response that businesses would, would take potentially to, to deal with problems? What, what other responses would, would members or ATT members or, or businesses be, be thinking of at this stage? I'm not sure. I'm not, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Go on, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure because our, 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 our client base is very much in, 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 in the SME, SME sector. Mm. And I'm not sure how much planning those are able to do without some hard facts. Yeah. It's all right to say, well, you know, and if this may happen or that may happen, but not, they're not really able to do, to do that mm -hmm. because, because for, the, for them, really, um, VAT is probably a major irritation, but it's probably a small part of running their, 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 their business. <laughs> they, what would they look for from, from, from you, perhaps, as a sort of member's body to, to you know, at what point would they start, in your experience, making, making some form of, form of plans? Well, they're looking for advice from, from, from us. And you need what to give that advice? L a lead from the politicians, if I may say so. Certainty. <laughs> yes, certainly. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> what we would like to do is go to our members of the small business and say, if you have small business clients, this is what they need to do and set yes. out quite clearly the steps they need yes. to take to make sure they're ready for Brexit, at the, whether that's April next year or at the end of the implementation period. But at the moment, we're, it's a little bit hampered by the fact that there is so much uncertainty. We can't tell them what to start doing. Would the implementation period be sufficiently long enough for um, most businesses to make uh, necessary arrangements? I don't know, I mean, Mr. Allen, you mentioned that the, the, what has happened in the past about moving from the, mm -hmm. the Channel Islands. Um, is, uh, what are we talking, um, 20 months, is that, is that long enough for people to make changes? In the SME sector, possibly, because they're less likely to be making large changes to business structure because they just don't have the resources to do that. I think they'll have to take it on the chin pretty much, but in mm -hmm. terms of the large yeah. business, I'm sure Daniel will. For larger businesses, a, a lot of this is very difficult, it's very costly. The point that's already been made about uncertainty is definitely uh, true. The other point that hasn't been raised so far is a lot of businesses are having to relocate part of their business assets due to regulatory re reasons, and that in turn has a VAT impact. You know, if you're moving part of your business to Luxembourg, etc., that's extra work as well. You know, my people I represent are retailers, so price is a very sensitive issue, and they don't have much time to react when suddenly you're faced with a, a big change in prices as a result of a, a, an alteration in the way VAT operates. So they, it's quite difficult to adjust to that um, quickly. Um, that's, that's the problem. So unless you know what's happening, you're really dealing with it at short notice. Um, I'm going to bring Catherine. Thank you, Chair. Um, so most of the discussion so far about uh, and the back implications of it has been in relation to goods um, crossing borders but um, I know you um, Deloitte in particular have raised some of the implications for financial services mm. and particularly um, uh, so, so some of the concerns that uh, your uh, business and the companies that you work with have could you just expand on some of those concerns for the benefit of the committee? I suppose from a financial services point of view, the main issue is at the moment when they supply services in the UK, those services fall to be exempt from VAT. They can't recover their input VAT. When they make those same uh, supplies to uh, customers in the EU, um, they can't recover their input tax. But when they're making supplies to non-EU counterparties, then they can recover their input tax. They're effectively zero-rated supplies, which in VAT terms is a, the best possible place to be. 
So when we leave the EU, the initial euphoria, if that's the right word to use in the context of that, um, was, was around um, whether making any supply to the EU would be zero rated, which would be a very good thing. Um, subsequently, uh, Treasury have dampened down expectations and said, well, the other answer is all supplies could be exempt and you don't get your VAT back at all for supplies made to non-EU as well as EU. The problem is, from a technical point of view, it's very hard to see how we differentiate between the EU and non-EU customers once we leave. Okay. Um, you, uh, the, your use of the term euphoria is, um, do you mean that in the sense of relief that we are moving into a new era, or do you mean euphor euphoria in the sense that there you're expecting some kind of bonanza as a result yes. of Brexit? Yes, no, no, well, well, it would have been, if, if that initial treatment had have applied and supplies made by insurance companies and banks uh, to EU counterparties had have fallen to be effectively zero rated, they would, they, they, there would be a gain, there would, there would be a windfall, if, if, if you like. Now, that is the logical answer. But obviously, you know, any gain for business is a loss to the Treasury. So, so the two have to be balanced. Okay. Um, so I know that there was a statement issued by the Treasury back in March about the, e, uh, the EU Commission's decision to issue infraction proceedings against the EU in relation to certain commodities that are being um, traded on the terminal markets order. That is all very complicated. Could you explain in more simple terms yes. um, what that means and what you think the implications may be? I could try. So the terminal markets order is an exception to the normal VAT rules. You've got a lot of commodities being traded at a wholesale basis, so the best known one is the London Metal Exchange and oils. There's actually also, I found out, a London Potato Futures Exchange. There's a whole range of these terminal markets. And for ease and to prevent fraud, all the supplies at the wholesale level in the terminal market are treated as being zero rated from a VAT point of view. They don't have to charge that. And that's quite sensible. Um, but we had a, um, a derogation to allow us to continue doing that because the EU doesn't like zero rates. Uh, but we've extended the number of exchanges which are part into that. And the argument that the Commission is making is you th have therefore... In, you have therefore, you're in breach of the principal VAT directive and these supplies should be treated as they normally should, which means that most of them should ought to be standard rated. So, so that's the challenge. It would have an impact, I guess, on the UK's terminal markets. We have a lot of wholesale trading in things like, in things like metals and oil and other products. Um, but possibly the result would be they would just simply have to charge VAT. So there'd be lots more VAT sort of swishing around in the system. And as we know, the more VAT there is in the system, the more danger there is of tax loss if, say, a major trader becomes bankrupt or something like that, that could be lost. So I hope we can keep our zero rates. Uh, and what's the reaction amongst uh, the sector to that decision? I think there was some surprise, um, because the Commission must have been aware of this for some considerable time. Mm. Um, um, uh, some people have said, and I'm, I'm not giving any credence to this at all, well, they're only doing it because we're leaving, uh, etc. Um, infraction proceedings tend to take a very long time. And so whether the infraction proceedings will be finished, they certainly won't be by the end of March next year, and they probably won't be by the end of 2020. So, 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 so it may well be the whole thing fizzles out, but, but it obviously has to be treated seriously. Yeah. And, do, and do you not think there's any connection at all with the decision to leave the EU in terms of the Commission's focus on this issue? No, you don't. Um, and that it's not some kind of warning that the EU will take um, quite a concerned view to the UK potentially behaving in a way that's anti-competitive once we leave the EU? Uh, I mean, I think the EU would uh, uh, be concerned if they thought it was anti-competitive. I suppose, thinking about it, the only anti-competitive element might be that these exchanges are based in London and po possibly without that favourable VAT system they might decide to relocate. I, I, I don't think there's any politics behind this. The sort of people that uh, are involved in fraction proceedings are highly technical VAT people like us. They're not politicians. Um, I'm not suggesting um, necessarily it's politically motivated, but in terms of getting House in order prior to Brexit, could there be something of that nature here? I'd be speculating. I, I mean, I, 
I suppose it's possible. I suppose it's possible. As, as I said, I don't think there's any particular VAT saving. I, the, the terminal markets order uh, really is a facilitation measure that, that means less tax has to be charged. You, ultimately, when the metals or the potatoes are sold, you, you know, VAT is charged if relevant. So, so, so there's no overall tax loss involved. Okay, so the main concerns in relation to financial services are, is clarity really on what the VAT situation is going to be? That's, that's certainly the biggest single issue, but there are others around the fact that from a regulatory point of view, a, a, a large number of players with customers in the EU have, uh, have um, changed branches into subsidiaries in different uh, member states. There's been a move in certain cases for places like Paris and Luxembourg and even Brussels. And um, as a result, they've now got VAT registrations there. So if there are supplies going backwards and forwards between, say, the London hub and the subsidiary in Brussels, there could be VAT on those, and so there could be an extra VAT cost. So, sorry, I've focused on, um, on, De- on Deloitte here, on Mr Lyons, purely because it's to do with financial services, but if any of the other committee members have any comments on the questions that I've asked... No. <laughs> Not your area, I, I fine. Think we, think one area we've, got, we've got to think about, actually, over the years, there's been a developing market, or it's been easier for actually business business to sell services, whether it's financial services or other services, into the, or the other EU countries. Now, now that, and, and along, alongside that, the EU Commission developed this, this well, developed the principle that VAT, that VAT should be pay, payable in the country of consumption, which means, in fact, that we actually, that's a very small business have to consider about what VAT is chargeable at where their customer is located. Now, that might again become more complicated because at present we have a one-stop shop system whereby, in fact, you actually log, you actually, by making arrangements via HMRC portal, you actually just make one return to HMRC and they feed up the tax to the, to the, the various countries. Now, that, that is a, a, a European-wide facility. Now, if we lose that, it will become more difficult for our, our, our UK businesses who sell services in, into the, what will be then be the EU, and where they may have to have multiple VAT registrations within the EU. So, but, you know, it, it gets more complicated for them in that way. <laughs> Charlie. Um, Mr. Allen, um, you uh, mentioned in your written evidence to this committee that you've worked with the campaign group VAT uh, fraud to expose VAT fraud by sellers on eBay, Amazon, and other online marketplaces. Um, changes were brought in in the Finance Act 2018 to start to crack down on this. How effective do you think they've been so far? They've improved when the changes were made in 2017, but the, the initial legislation that came in was not very effective because it didn't actually do what it said on the tin. It said it made the the online platforms liable, but it didn't because they had the option to avoid any liability by removing the trader from the platform. The new measures that are brought in are tougher uh, because it talks about new or should have known. I think the thing that concerns us more than anything still is that there seems to be no prosecutions and no confiscation of stock from warehouses. Um, we had confirmation from Amazon that there had been no request to confiscate stock. And interestingly, about three weeks ago, we were contacted by a German lawyer who was defending Chinese traders that had been um, prosecuted. And he told us that the German tax authorities had actually threatened directors at Amazon with criminal action if they didn't hand over data. And they were confiscating stock with no warning whatsoever. And our view is that's a much more, much more of an incentive to not behave like that um, if that kind of action is taken. So it's been effective, but I still think that it's a bit... Um, the voluntary arrangement is a bit we don't understand, is why should it be voluntary to hand over data on people that are effectively evading VAT? And is your understanding that in Germany, Amazon are in fact handing over the data? Yeah, we've got, uh, we were told, we've been given information to prove it, that they were actually told, hand it over or we will prosecute you. Um, I think there is a piece of German legislation that's slightly tougher than here uh, to do with um, being involved in any way with a fraudulent transaction, which the Germans were arguing Amazon was. So that was very interesting. So, so to compare to Germany, our, our taxpayers are being, still being taken for a ride and Amazon are still in a position where they don't have to hand over the information. It seems very relaxed. You know, I mean, I think small traders get rather annoyed when they find themselves being investigated for VAT fairly 
in a fairly tough manner where big companies don't seem to get the same kind of um, attention. So, um, yeah, I, I think you're right. It's, it's not really tough enough at the moment. Do, do you think that small businesses get the book for them while big, big combines like uh, Amazon get off lightly because the, uh, the Treasury have a, a, a secret policy or secret direction to HMRC not to be too hard on the big boys? I was told by a senior official that they had been, HMRC had been instructed not to go too hard on Amazon yet. What the reason for that is, I don't know. So that, that would be a political, might be political, <coughs> there might be some reason for it. But it seemed odd, that statement, because I can't believe a small business would ever be given that kind of slack. It's very, would you agree it's very troubling if that was the case? Because all taxpayers, big or small, should be treated the same under the rule of law. Yeah, and I think this seems to be a, um, something that's been happening in the States as well. I'm in contact with people in America that say that Amazon is getting favourable treatment from the tax authorities in various states. And it could be due to providing employment. I don't know. I don't know what the reason for it would be. But, yeah, I agree. Um. And do you think that there is a, a, a concern that the sort of tax conditions in which online retailers like eBay and Amazon uh, operate, uh, there's a concern that they have an unfair competitive advantage over high street businesses that pay business rates, that pay their taxes, that employ people in Britain whereas these enterprises don't. Yes, uh, and the reason for that is because the, the regulation environment in which those online businesses operate is not as tough as a regulatory environment as a high street retailer. Uh, you can get away with, I mean, you couldn't sell dangerous products in a shop. You couldn't um, openly be selling goods where there's no VAT charge them, charge them in a shop. There's other issues to do with business rates and other advantages, warehouses aren't charged the same as a, as a high street shop. So there is a huge imbalance between online retail and uh, high street retail. But the reality is, is that online retail is nothing other than mail order, which has been around for a very long time, over 100 years. So there's a big myth that's built up around online retail that it's some kind of magic business, when in fact it's just mail order. Um, so so, so looking, at, looking at that, there are a lot of people who say we must defend the high street and save the high street. Do you think that what we really need to be doing is ensuring there's a level competitive playing field between high street retailers and online or mail order uh, retailers? Yeah, I think there needs to be a toughening of the regulation of <coughs> online retailers and specifically my own view is the biggest problem with online retail is these are private marketplaces operated by one company and there is no regulation of the ownership of a private marketplace. Um, the owner of a private marketplace online gets to see the sales data of everybody selling on that platform and can use that to their advantage, selling products themselves. Now, the only example I have found similar to that is a container port, and I understand that there is regulation in place to prevent owners of container ports abusing their position. That needs to be brought in, there needs to be legislation that controls private <coughs> marketplaces because you certain, to call it a marketplace is misleading, it's nothing like a car boot sale, Amazon isn't like a car boot sale, um, neither is eBay. So uh, there is a big legislative gap that needs to be filled in my view and that would correct a lot of these issues. These are the symptoms of that in my view. So, so if I have to ask you for a menu of, of reforms, what would your sort of top three be? It would be to bring in some kind of controls over what can be done by an owner of a private marketplace. For example, I, I've always been surprised that the data that is handled by these marketplaces, for example, if you're a retailer, they can see all your sales, who you sell to, what, everything about your business. Um, I'm surprised there, are no, there is no data protection legislation dealing with that. Um, and also the way in which they can manipulate prices on their own marketplace. I've seen online, I've seen Amazon selling lost leader products at prices below the price at which they're buying it, just to obtain the market share in a particular product sector. Um, they will produce a product to, that is a copy. For instance, there's been huge battles over things like data cables on, on eBay and Amazon. Amazon brought in their own range of products, but I know for a fact that some of those products 
have been undercutting people that were market leaders on that marketplace. So there needs to be rules about private marketplaces because otherwise the danger is there is nothing stopping somebody manipulating that position. Uh, and and uh, do you think that we ought to consider maybe a VAT surcharge for overseas retailers who sell into Britain and don't contribute to our tax system business point, rates or jobs? I think the Australians have done this already. It comes in July 1st. I had, I'm subscribed to a, to, to a fairly obscure website that sells records and I was surprised to receive an email the other day saying if you're selling in Australia from now on, 10% <coughs> of your price will be paid directly to the Australian government. So it's working. I mean, um, and I understand Sweden's done it as well. That would immediately solve two problems. It would stop the avoidance of VAT if it was VAT was collected in that manner, but it would also introduce effectively a extra cost on these cheap imports that would protect British retailers from avalanche of cheap stuff that's coming in for other reasons, such as the postal issues with China. Um, that's another problem. Um, so uh, I think that would be definitely a step forward. Uh, and then finally, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, VAT fraud helped the Belgian tax authorities when they were unable to get help from HMRC. Uh, can you give any further information about what help Belgium wanted from HMRC and why that help was not forthcoming? Yes, I read with interest in one of the presentations the attitude of HMRC towards people that are trying to check whether or not their uh, business is tax compliant but they weren't getting a straight answer. Yes, that arrangement is okay. Similarly, when we've, a lot of our members, in my own experience, when you write to HMRC and say, I'm being affected by an abusive arrangement or, or someone not charging VAT, <coughs> you don't really get any response or any assistance at all. And we were contacted by the Belgian tax authorities uh, who were extremely interested in what we were doing. They had seized uh, container loads of goods from China that they would worked out were being sold on Amazon. They asked one of our members to go over there and look at it. They showed them all the stuff, and then they asked them, can you help us spot it online? We've never had any interaction like that with HMRC whatsoever. Yeah. It's been, it's almost like, um, it's a one-way communication. So do you think HMRC is a bit big, big digital business captured? I think they need to think more creatively when dealing with people coming to them with information. Treat them not really as... Um, some kind of threat, but more as potential uh, assistant in, in resolving this issue. Um, I am surprised that there is no dedicated online VAT team of people that seem to be... Uh, so you need a mixture of sort of trading standards and VAT people because you've got two issues mixed in, uh, dangerous products, no tax. I think it would finance itself as well. I think a more kind of... Uh, um, gregarious attitude to, to people that are trying to assist would, would result in a bigger tax take. I don't know whether there's any legal implications um, of being too close to somebody giving information, but I can't believe that there would be. Thank you. Did any of the other panel, panellists have anything to say about evasion before, before we move on? Uh, yes, um, I guess um, a couple of points. Um, it's um, one of the fundamental problems with the VAT is the underlying legislation hasn't changed very much in the last 50 years. So uh, it certainly wasn't envisaged by the people who wrote the original VAT di directive there would be such a thing as the internet. Now you make a very good point that mail order has been around for a long time, but the, the globalisation of business to consumer trade has, has, has grown hugely in the last 10 to 20 years. And so it's difficult for HMRC, indeed the law, to keep up. HMRC have done a number of things over the last few years. There's a joint and several liability, the new fulfilment house regulations, <coughs> which place duties on the uh, businesses that actually store these goods before they're distributed. Uh, and there are some signs that it's beginning to work. Now, now I, Mr. Allen uh, makes some excellent points, and uh, we're absolutely not there yet. But the normal HMRC approach is to let things bed down so you can see what the impact of those have been, and then if further measures and law changes are necessary, to do that. So I think we probably need to allow a, a period of time to allow those changes to bed down. There are a lot of extra registrations, lots of traders apparently being kicked off platforms. So those look like positive signs. Okay. Okay. And I think, yeah, I think we'd echo um, what Daniel said about letting things bed in. Um, the worst thing that you see in policy design in tax policy is often knee-jerk sort of reactions to things that are ill thought out and then have to be revised or, or don't operate in the way intended. So. Um, uh, yeah, I think from the ATT perspective, we definitely echo that. Of, we think we're moving in the right direction and sort of see how it works. 
Okay, thank you. Um, Stuart. Follow on from some of uh, Charlie's questions. Before I do that, you're right when you say online is no different to mail order. It's been around for a long time. But thinking back, apart from niche suppliers, records would be one of those, and the large catalogue companies, is the difference not that so many more people can now legitimately trade online without the costs of bricks and mortar, and indeed legitimately in many cases under the VAT threshold, does that not confuse the situation a lot? You're right. Uh, I think really what online has done is it's made mail order more accessible because you can have an instantly updatable catalogue. It's yeah. available 24-7. It's also unusually, people didn't used to buy mail order from, say, Germany, but now you just translate the website and you can buy something from Germany. So you're right, it's grown because of that. It's easier. I think it's also become more attractive, though, because people have got used to the fact that prices don't, didn't include VAT because there was a very long period where this fraud was going on and not being dealt with. So I was discussing earlier before we came in, I remember when the Channel Islands was huge, which magazine ran an article on, on the best places to buy CDs and DVDs and they were promoting a massive VAT avoider in Jersey as the best place for consumers to go. So people have come to this expectation that online is cheaper and it is cheaper, but they, people didn't really realise why it was cheaper. Well, I'm going to come back to the um, Jersey and Guernsey stuff first, and that point you made about VAT not being paid, because you described Ravas as representing the interests of anonymous retailers who are unable to publicly speak out against VAT avoidance due to the fact that VAT is perceived by some customers as optional. So can you tell the committee what you mean by perceived as optional? It's seen as a tax that the consumer can avoid either by paying cash to somebody or going to a website that doesn't charge VAT. And I recall I, when I was running my business, an employee asked if they could order 15 packages and have them delivered to the office. And when they turned up, I said, what is this stuff? It all came from Jersey. And they said, oh, it's, um, it's VAT free. It's fantastic. Um, and it was seen as a benefit, and it was promoted as such for a long time. I've got plenty of press cuttings. Um, so I saw HMRC did a presentation at the Public Accounts Committee in which I was involved, in which they had looked at the possibility of having consumers police VAT. Absolutely no chance that's going to happen. Um, so, you, yeah, it's, it, there's a mindset that's developed that you can somehow get around having to pay it. Is it is it not more insidious than that? People aren't going to search out the VAT free option, but when something is substantially cheaper than one might expect. It appears at the search engines, exactly. That's then, why price is such an issue online. Exactly. If something is cheaper, it will be high in the search engines. So if you can get the cheaper product, you will dominate the market. But it surely isn't for the consumer to identify that. Many consumers don't even understand VAT, what VAT is or, or how it operates or, or the detail behind it. In fact, mm. I recall dealing with customers who are going, you're a rip-off, you charge VAT. You know, that, I actually had customers say that a number of times. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, how you get around that problem? So you would, would your judgment be that public attitude remains a major part of the problem? It's changed a huge amount because when Rava started, tax campaigning didn't exist. Um, I can recall ringing around a national, major national newspapers and one of them said to me, VAT, that's not a story. Everybody avoids that. That was their attitude. Um, it's changed now, I think, because people can perceive that public services are being, under, are being affected by the loss of tax. Um, but uh, they tend to point their finger more at big corporate companies avoiding corporation tax rather than people avoiding that. And the, the, but the, the, the real issue here, isn't it, is the unfairness between those traders who play by the rules, those in this country who choose not to, and those in certain jurisdictions for whom it's just not an issue at all. They simply don't pay it. 
Yeah, which is why it's very important that VAT is policed very strongly because the, the underlying um, thinking behind VAT is the VAT system must be fiscally mm -hmm. neutral and therefore it must be policed, not merely in terms of cost. I was concerned to see uh, HMRC talking about the cost involved of raiding a warehouse. I don't think they're looking at the cost properly because there might be a cost involved of getting a warrant and going to a warehouse. And, but the cost of not doing that is distortion in the market, businesses getting put out of business. It's not just loss of VAT. It has a, an effect, as you described, that, that, that damages a wider, the blast radius, if you like, is, is bigger than just the loss of the VAT. Um, and I'm sorry I'm focusing on you, Mr. Allen, but uh, a number of these questions are quite specific. Uh, you uh, also described uh, LBCR abuse as rife between 2004 and 2012, and that it went back as far as 1996, and you've spoken uh, about the role of Jersey and Guernsey in seeking to prevent changes to the law. The EU now plans to remove VAT exemption for small consignments by 2021. Why, in your view, has it taken so long for this to be dealt with properly? Well, when we first raised it with the EU Commission, it was low down their um, list of priorities. Um, out of interest, I mean, I, at the time, knew absolutely nothing about the EU Commission. I, there's, Ravis doesn't have a political agenda, obviously. Everyone's got their own individual views on it. But our agenda has always been to stop abuses that use of, ta of VAT to basically undercut your competitor. When we first w went to them, which was 2006, it wasn't high up on their agenda. When we showed them the size of the industry in the Channel Islands, they were quite horrified. That was the kind of turning point because they then started looking seriously at the low value consignment relief exemption, the way in which it was being abused by online retail. I would say around 2004 to 2006, it took off at an exponential rate hugely. I've seen the, the figures on it um, because the internet online retail was started to really take hold big time around about that period and they bumped it up their agenda and made it a major priority. They employed Ernst & Young who did a major survey and they discovered that it was a problem Europe wide and they then put proposals in place to completely abolish that and change the way in which VAT will be collected and essentially what they want to do is introduced VATMOS on physical goods. We have VATMOS on services now, it was described earlier. To me that makes perfect sense because the VAT will then be charged at the point of sale in the checkout to, <coughs> to the customer and handed to the member state. So uh, presumably that will have an advantage in that VAT will be co collected in member states where the sale is being made. And for the UK, that's quite significant because we're one of the biggest internet markets in, in the world, I think. Germany's taken over recently. Ms. Watson, if uh, someone's not VAT registered because the turnover is genuinely low, how would that work? Would they have VAT automatically applied to their sale, even though they shouldn't have? No. How would it work? No. Um, that's a difficulty, yeah. Um, they wouldn't, would they, if they were not that registered? No, no, yeah. the, no the mini one-stop shop no. shouldn't apply to businesses no. below the VAT registration. Right, so they would still yeah. require, in essence, to be a small consignment exemption <coughs> from VAT being oh, collected no. on no, sale. No, 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 no. How would it work? No. 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 Well, Mr. Well, Taylor, explain. Exemption is, is different from okay. some... Okay. This different principle from that which applies to a business which is not on and doesn't re, is not bound to register a VAT. The, bit, the small business that was, was turn over is below the VAT threshold. They're not registered, they don't charge VAT. And therefore they'll just carry on trading you know, without charging VAT. Now you have someone actually, which, which we're talking about, VAT avoidance, avoidance through the internet sales, through online sales, essentially we're talking about businesses which are based outside the EU, selling into the EU and selling into Britain. Because if, I, if, I, if I'm, I'm living in Devon, if I want to actually start up a, an, an online business selling goods, I, if I sell to someone in Scotland, I'm going to charge, charge VAT. Now, but that Scottish buyer may have, may, have, may have done some research on the internet and found there's a supplier based somewhere out in China. <laughs> It's going to offer a cheaper price because they, they're, they're not concerned with paying British 
UK VAT. Perhaps, perhaps the key point yes. is for a non-EU uh, seller, there is no VAT yeah. registration threshold. Thre thre threshold. Any sales at all, they should register for VAT. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Yeah. 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 Any yeah. sales at all. So right. you've yeah. got the, the UK market yes. where you yeah. have to be Thank over the VAT threshold yeah. to charge VAT. Yeah. Um, if you're an outside seller outside the UK, you, you, there is no threshold. I think that clarity is really important yeah. uh, yes. and that's yes. helpful. Yes. Uh, Mr Lyons, yes. can I just uh, ask you, this um, exploitation using the Channel Islands went on for a long time until the law was changed. Now, there's no suggestion that any of this activity was necessarily fraudulent, but would routing supply chains through the Channel Islands to exploit LVCR have been seen by the profession as VAT avoidance when it was going on? <clears throat> That's a good question. I, um, one of the problems around this is we have lots of different words for it. It would, probably would have been described as VAT planning, and the approach at the time, and it was a number of years ago, would have been there is a legitimate relief here, as long as we abide by the rules. Um, and particularly, you know, it's a point that Mr. Allen's made a few, a few times. Um, when, there's, uh, when your competitors are doing it, clients think they haven't got any choice. Yes. I've had that argument in relation to lots of businesses, and I've never been dreadfully convinced by it. OK, so let's call it VAT planning mm. or avoidance. If that sort of planning was viable today, would it be in breach of professional conduct in relation to taxation standards for tax planning to propose it to a company? I think it might be, you know. I think it might be. I've, I've, I've wrote it down here, not to create, encourage or promote arrangements that are contrary to the clear intention of Parliament and or are highly artificial or contrived. Yeah. And I think it's that artificial or contrived I've, I've element. That I've sat with senior people at the Commission and discussed this actual issue. Um, there is really no such thing as a legitimate VAT avoidance scheme. Uh, the reason is, is because if there was, then it would just completely distort the market. Because the VAT directive specifically obligates member states to prevent evasion, avoidance, abuse and market distortion. Um, there are differences in VAT rates, obviously, between different products and different countries. That, I think, has been through the courts and that was not, that's not regarded as avoidance. You're just in a different part of the EU. But if you're taking something, for instance, an import VAT exemption, and you're abusing it, and obviously sending goods to Jersey to have them sent back again, no matter how complicated you make the arrangement, is abusive. Um, the issue is, is in terms of VAT avoidance, the definition, and it's been de decided in a, in a case called Direct Cosmetics and Lawtons versus HMRC, the definition is, is where there is an objective loss of VAT. It is avoidance. If you can see the VAT being lost as a result of the arrangement, it's avoidance. So I think the Channel Islands ticks that box, two boxes. It's abusive and it's avoidance. Right, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, good morning. I want to ask about um, the issue of VAT avoidance in relation to the NHS. But, but before I do, I just want to pick up on um, a similar theme to, to, to Stuart and Charlie um, and turn to another example of VAT uh, avoidance in the gig economy, which is Uber. Um, now, I, I think there are two issues that, that strike me. So I'm interested in, in getting sort of the tax advice um, and then um, the perspective on fairness um, from across the panel. Um, firstly, it, it seems to me that Uber doesn't pay VAT on fees it charges drivers because of a loophole in how tax is collected in business-to-business -business sales across EU borders. So because it, where Uber's company is based, which I think is Belgium off the top of my head, um, I think they, they managed to get away with charging or paying VAT on the fees it collects from drivers. It's 40,000 drivers in the UK. Uh, are you familiar with this? Loophole or with this case, and do you, is my reading of the of the challenge and the loophole correct? I'm less familiar with that aspect of Uber's VAT affairs. If if that is the case, and they're based in either I think the Netherlands or, as you say, Belgium, it, the it, you're right. It, it might be because there's no VAT reverse charge because the um, because the individual cab drivers are all trading below the VAT registration threshold. So that might be why there's no VAT charge on the supply made from the I Netherlands. You think that's it? I would, I would agree with that. Is it because the, the, I don't know what they call it, what fee the Uber charges the drivers based in the UK, um, because Uber is based in Belgium, 
and the uh, uh, Netherlands, sorry, Netherlands, and the drivers in the UK and the consumer of the service, they wouldn't uh, um, Uber wouldn't pay Netherlands VAT on that service. They would expect VAT to be accounted in the place of consumption, which is the UK. And if the Uber driver is VAT registered, that would happen. Not, which brings me on to which, which is what, which is the point Mr. Lyons is, is raising. That's what I wanted to, to come on. That that, that um, clarity around the, the border issue um, is, is helpful because um, it seems to me what um, Uber is doing is treating its forty thousand drivers as separate businesses, um, requiring them to pay VAT where. They're, where they reach the VAT threshold, which, of course, as many cab drivers, they don't tend to. So we've actually got a significant degree of VAT avoidance because draw, drawing on Stuart's analogy about um, online traders um, and effectively modern mail order services, as far as I'm concerned, Uber's a minicab company with an app. And this idea that they simply connect um, custom with drivers is ludicrous. If I phone Redbridge Radio Cars, they're providing the same service. Um, and, and, but I imagine that um, they would be paying their, their fair share of taxes, and, and if not, the tax authorities would be onto them in the way they're simply not with Uber. There have been a number of VAT cases over the years where small um, cab firms have used that, uh, that same approach and have argued that all the drivers are self-employed and they're simply providing them with a radio and administrative service. So, so, so that has been done on a much, much smaller scale. Like in your experience? Um, some of it depends. They're all very fact-specific cases. Uh, so some of them have been successful and some ha- haven't. Yeah, yeah Mr. Mr. Um, Allen, I'll bring you in at this point. Yeah, um, it's interesting, this, because uh, I mentioned the case that defined uh, the, the, what VAT avoidance was. That was to do with a business, businesses that were not intentionally avoiding VAT, but they were essentially... Uh, They had agents, Um, one of them was selling cosmetics, and those agents were below the VAT threshold. And HMRC obtained a derogation uh, to charge them VAT to make the the main company supplying these agents pay VAT on the basis Mm. of it was a VAT avoidance arrangement because each one was below the threshold and didn't have to pay VAT. Now, I don't understand why they're not applying that to that arrangement. not least because you can obtain a derogation. So you can go to the European Commission and you can essentially say, we want to change our VAT rules because we want to stop avoidance. So they're allowed to change, change those rules. That would be interesting, That's Mr fact, Taylor. But, yeah. but that particular case was all to do about the, va- the, va- the, the, the amount upon which VAT was payable, the value of what the independent sellers, their services, and whether it should be based upon, based upon the value of the product which, which they were t- out to buy from Avon inst- in, in, instead of being paid, <laughs> or whether they took their, t- took their remuneration in, in cash. So it's a different principle to, to actually say, why don't we make all Uber drivers or, or people? The point I was making was that they went to get a derogation and they argued we need to stop that avoidance. Yeah. That was the basis upon which they went to get a derogation. So whilst the examples are different... The principle is, is if there is that being avoided, why not just change the rules to, to bring it within the scope? And the other thing was I understood that Uber had problems with arguing that their drivers were not employees recently. Well, yeah, I was going to yeah. mention that. I mean, and, you so know, how can you one, once an by an employment tribunal, once by um, mm-hmm. an EU advocate general, you know, the, the, the debate has been whether Uber is simply a technology platform or a transportation company and whether its drivers are, are employees. Um, and, you know, rulings in both of those cases would, would, I think, make it much harder for Uber to genuinely argue um, on principle terms that they shouldn't be paying VAT here in the UK. I, I, I think, to be fair to them, I, think that I suspect the UK ruling classified them as workers, which is a sort of intermediate category between employed and self-employed. Uh, but the problem, I think, with VAT, well, the most difficult thing about VAT is the facts. I mean, the VAT law it can be relatively clear. It's, it's the facts. So there are two different interpretations. Is this a company that employs a lot of drivers and therefore they're supplying the services of those drivers, in which case they must be way above the VAT registration threshold and they should be charging that? Or indeed, is it a, a, a network of drivers and Uber is simply providing a management charge? Yeah. And do you think um, HMRC's approach to... Um, either this this case or um, cases like this is fair and consistent. I think can I just check back. You said actually whether people, are, the tax drivers, are getting away with it by having 
tax drivers are self-employed and not, pay, not earning enough to be VAT registered. They're not actually getting away with it because, in fact, the principles which are operating were decided by the British courts in, in VAT cases many years ago. They looked, looked at some taxi firms and the way in which they operated, and they decided, in fact, as, as Daniel has tried to de describe, that, 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 that there was a core business at the centre that offered services to, the, to these independent drivers, and, and, and the drivers should be, tr should be treated, for tax purposes, as self-employed and, and separate businesses. And it's, it's the courts which have decided that, not HMRC, not, 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 not Parliament, well, but the courts. My, my <laughs> question isn't about whether drivers are getting away with it, because clearly they're, they're earning too little anyway, and I'm certainly not trying to drive down their wages any further. It's quite, quite the opposite, um, in, in actually, in the case of the way Uber drivers treat it. It's more about whether the company isn't paying its fair share of VAT as Uber um, to the Exchequer to fund the public services that our constituents rely on. I, I, I think everyone should pay their fair tax and the tax which is due because we need that to fund, fund the public services. But if Uber is, and I don't know too much about Uber, is if, 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 <laughs> off the table. If, if Uber is, is only based its model in enlarge the model which has been operated for taxi firms in the UK, which has been endorsed by the, by the British courts, it's very difficult for us as tax advisors to sort of... This is an interesting one as well, isn't it? Because in, in the case of Uber, there was a massive crowdfunding appeal, which I think raised over £100,000. But in the end, that case isn't progressing in the way that I think lots of us would like, and probably including HMRC in terms of getting that clarity from, from the courts, because of the liabilities on people who are bringing, these, who are bringing the cases and the potential risk... Um, involved in terms of personal risk. So simply saying, don't worry, because this is for the courts to resolve, isn't very satisfactory, because we've got, you know, the revenue kind of saying, well, we're not too sure about where we stand on this, and clarity from the courts would be helpful. The courts actually ultimately not going to be able to make a judgment because of the risk involved in bringing a case. So actually, Parliament does have to have some oversight of this, A, because we write the tax laws, and B, we want to make sure they're working well, and thirdly, want to make sure that taxpayers have been treated equitably. So this is absolutely within Parliament's remit. Uh, it, that's my point. It's, it's, not, it's not for us to do it, but Parliament has, has the power to change the legislation. Uh, it, it, it's quite an interesting case, because the case you've uh, referred to is being ta taken by a very well-known barrister, tax barrister, and uh, he is seeking to recover the input VAT on the invoice he got from an Uber driver yeah. uh, on the basis of the, the, that Uber should be VAT registered. What has not occurred thus far is there hasn't been an assessment from HMRC on Uber for the VAT. No. Yeah. Um, so, so that's the case you're, you're referring to. And that to. would be helpful, would it, that, that kind of HMRC assessment? Well, we can only assume that HMRC must have formed the, 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 the view that the supplies are not subject to VAT. Well, yeah, I mean, um, getting an answer of, of, on a specific case from HMRC is like trying to get blood out of the stone, well, in, in spite of the obviously public policy interest. Finally, just on this, we've uh, got quiet. a final Going question. Going back to the core principle, I'm not an expert on the Uber um, structure, but the, the question that really needs to be asked is, is there an objective loss of VAT? Is there, a, is there an avoidance of VAT that's distorting competition in any way? Mm. That's, that's, from my perspective of... of our group of people would be if there are taxi drivers who are effectively at a competitive disadvantage as a, as a result of that arrangement, then it should be dealt with. Well, and that's, 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 I think that's the nub of the issue because I think there are other digital platforms that do pay VAT in the way I described. Just that finally, project, yes, I'm yeah. very sorry to digress on my hobby horse. <laughs> I, I should have said I'm chair of the all, I said I, I'm chair of the all party parliamentary group on taxis as opposed to taxes. <laughs> um, but I find the overlap between the two is is is, is quite significant. Um, just just finally, um, NHS trusts hmm. and the uh, I think fairly well publicised um, issue about NHS trusts employing agency locums or temporary workers on contracts for, for you know, for, for as little, sometimes as little as a, a period as a shift mm. in order to save the VAT they might otherwise uh, have paid. Um, I think all of us around this table in any conversation we have an NHS Trust are, are hugely sensitive to the financial pressure they're under. However, what we're looking at are the tax rules, how they're applied and whether they're being used or abused fairly. Um, is this still an issue um, with hospital trusts using VAT planning in this way? Um, are you aware of the use of similar schemes being used elsewhere in the 
um, public sector, um, and is this something that we ought to be concerned about? Um, uh, y yes, this sort of um, this sort of uh, planning is uh, still taking place. It relies on a very uh, simple principle, and that's that salaries, wages are not subject to VAT. So if you employ temporary staff and they are treated under the VAT rules or HMRC's view as being employed by the employment agency, you pay VAT on the agency's fees, but you also pay it on the underlying wages, which you wouldn't pay if they were your employees. Yeah. Um, so this planning, which in my view isn't really planning at all, is saying, well, put the staff on your books, uh, NHS Trust, and then there will be your staff and there will be no VAT costs. Now, there is a consequence of that, the whole series of consequences, that you have, uh, you are governed by employment law, you have various obligations towards them, etc., which you wouldn't have if they were temps. So, to, to my mind, if you're putting people on your books, you're treating them as full-time employees, albeit I, I, I take your point that sometimes these... Uh, these uh, periods of work can be quite short, yeah. um, and you're accepting the full legal consequences, I, I think that probably falls outside of the definition of VAT planning. Any other views from the panel on that? I don't know enough about that case, but I did have somebody tell me that in their view it was abusive. Abusive of, in terms of VAT rules? Or essentially restructuring, restructuring something to make it appear to be something that it otherwise wouldn't be. Um, but that's a, you know... And how much, as, as, um, in terms of um, the sort of the, uh, tax advisors, how much of your time is spent looking at public sector tax planning and tax management? Um, I'd, I'd say a very, a, a, a very small amount, uh, a very small amount, less than five percent, possibly less than that. Even, yeah, I think even less than that. Would, 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 would so, not something that should be exercising us relative to other issues. Is the message? I, not, from, not from our perspective. Sure, sure, the NHS and others will breathe a sigh of relief, and I'll <laughs> pass back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Lyons. Can I ask you? In your written evidence to the committee, you said, in terms of talking international VAT arbitrage, I think you said it's unclear what proportion of the VAT gap is attributable to international VAT planning. Defining this part of the gap is problematic. Later on, you said. We consider that businesses that do not account for VAT in the UK, which might be reasonably expected to, to make up a, a material part of the VAT gap. I wonder, notwithstanding the fact you described it as problematic, you obviously agree that that's where it's going from. What if you could give the committee some idea of what you think the size and scale of that gap is? It's always very hard to measure these things. I mean, to put the whole thing in perspective, uh, the total amount of estimated VA loss, VAT loss through avoidance out of a total of something like 12.6 billion is only 100 million. I shouldn't have said only there because that's still a, a, an enormous amount of money. Um, so, but there is certainly, there are opportunities, particularly if you already have a business which is established offshore, particularly outside of the EU, to mitigate VAT. And, and I think those things fall into broadly two categories. One is you already have a business and you apply the correct VAT treatment and you obtain, if you like, a VAT windfall. Uh, the other one is you deliberately decide to go and relocate your loan broking business in Jersey, as was the case with the ocean finance case, and that was a, a matter of fact, I think. And, um, and, and, and therefore you get a VAT adva advantage from structuring in that way. So um, I think it's relatively significant within the remit of the fact that VAT avoidance itself is quite a small niche industry, really. I mean, you, you also described the international broking business in that answer. But in layman's terms, could you describe the sort of international arbitrage schemes yes. that we should, be, we should be aware of? Yes, so, 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 so the most um, well-known one is probably the ocean finance uh, arrangement, whereby there was a loan broking business in the UK. It bought in a lot of advertising. It was charged VAT on the advertising. Loan broking itself is exempt, and so they suffered an irrecoverable VAT cost on the VAT charged to, to them. They moved the loan broking business to Jersey. There is no indication in the evidence in the case uh, that they, they skimped on that. They properly moved the business there. It was established in Jersey. And uh, therefore, the advertisers made their supplies out to Jersey. No VAT on those. The loan broking business made its supplies back to the customers in the UK. No VAT there. So the VAT, the irrecoverable... Um, input VAT simply disappeared. 
And the challenge which has been brought by HMRC, or one of the challenges, is that's abusive. That's avoidance and therefore should fail. And in that particular case, what was the size of that that was avoided? We're talking about low millions. I mean, I think it's a relatively small business. We're not talking about norms. I don't have the exact number here, but it wasn't hundreds of millions. So, notwithstanding the fact it's a relatively small amount, it's there, it's discernible, it's identifiable. Um, under the current international treaties, um, is it something that could international tax arbitrage? Is it something that could be addressed? Would we are we going to be better or worse off? As a result of leaving the EU, are there things that should be done to, stre- to strengthen international rules? Well, um, I think it's largely a matter for the courts because everything rests on its own facts. Uh, I mean, the uh, Halifax rule, which is the lead case on VAT avoidance from about, about 12 years ago, uh, uh, sets out the rule. And if something is outside the scope of the VAT legislation and was done to obtain a tax advantage it should fail under the Halifax rule. So that's almost like a general anti-abuse or anti-avoidance rule in VAT. So if the courts decide that a particular arrangement is abusive, then it will fail. So I I think we already have the judicial mechanism there to attack these schemes where they don't work. And the ocean uh, finance scheme is still being litigated, and it's possible the courts may find that it does work. Under those rules, how many um, cases are the HMRC actively trying to push to the courts under those rules for international tax arbitrage? I think there's a, there's a relatively small number. I mean, there's a, there are other forms of arbitrage which, which don't apply in the UK but relate to things like yachts and private jets and things where some member states have slightly more generous rules than others and uh, there's been a focus, I think, on places like um, uh, uh, Cyprus and Malta. Um, but, but generally quite a small number of cases. They tend to be quite high profile because of their subject matter. But the, the Pen, Pendragon case a few years ago on, on sales of demonstrator cars was another case that involved, uh, I, I think, a Jersey or a Guernsey link. Perhaps I can widen this out a little bit more generally now. In the, um, notwithstanding that 100 million is not a large sum in the sale of 12.6 billion, it is still a decent sum of money. Yes. Um, I wonder if I could ask everybody on the panel, Given the measuring tax, tax gaps publication, um, it was rather suggesting that 100 million is rather a small amount of money and that they may not even include it as an estimate in future. Um, does that, first of all, does the 100 million sound about right? And is that a good or a bad thing that we're not even going to include it in the estimates in the future of concern? Perhaps Mr. Taylor. I'm going to dodge that question if you don't mind, because I have no, no way of actually knowing whether that's a reasonable figure or not. I'm not an economist. We do, as, as an association of taxation technicians, we don't employ economists. We, we actually rely upon other people's data in this. But, 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 so, but whether, or not it's a, whether or not it's the right figure, yes. is it a good or a bad idea that the HMRC are now likely to exclude it from their own estimates of what the gap might be? What, on tax avoid? No, the, the international tax arbitrage element. I think probably information is useful, but it turns out if it's so inaccurate, <laughs> we can't, or it's not measurable, perhaps we should forget about it. Do you know who else wants to proffer a view? I think we, sh- we should continue to measure and monitor. It, it's, uh, compared to the overall VAT gap, it's a relatively small num- number, but it could grow and it, and, and, and it should be looked at. The, the underlying point, and the reason I believe it's so low, is there is virtually no appetite for VAT avoidance amongst uh, major businesses in the UK at all. None whatsoever. Nobody's interested. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Simon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Lyons, HMRC attributes about £3.5 billion of the 2014-15 VAT gap to what they call avoidable taxpayer mistakes in their VAT returns. It's very difficult, obviously, to put a quantum on these things. Is, but is that broadly something which you think is, is a reasonable figure? I would, uh, it's the biggest single number in the VAT gap. And, yeah. uh, and I would think that is reasonable because VAT is complicated. There are lots of special schemes, special arrangements, particularly for smaller businesses. I'm sure ATT will have a lot to say on, on, on this point. It's hard to, to manage. I would be surprised if it wasn't the biggest single number. 
80, yeah, 80 Yeah, and, and I think within that three and a half billion, there, there's a, a whole range of errors, and, and the problem we have is we're not quite sure what's driving that figure. Mm -hmm. There's um, sort of technical errors, which might be uh, incorrect classification of goods for VAT, uh, incorrect claiming of input tax, so the sort of technical things where you're just getting that wrong, mm. through to arithmetical errors, transposition errors, um, and it's not quite sure sort of how much those different elements are contributing to the um, tax gap figures. No, indeed. Um, Mr. Yeah, there's Taylor. a whole range of behaviour. I, I, I don't think it's reasonable for us, as, even as a professional body, to actually um, justify that figure or to endorse it. Because uh, my, my simple analogy, analogy is if I'm actually building a new house and I want to know how it's going to cost, I'm going to employ a quantity surveyor. I don't ask the builder. Now, if you want to know whether that tax gap is accurate, please go and ask, ask an economist or the, 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 the National Statistics, Office of National, National Statistics. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Presumably, ATT members have had clients who have inadvertently made these errors. And whilst, yeah, I mean, this is perhaps a more uh, practical question in terms of how we might try and prevent those errors occurring. And short of major changes to the VAT system, what practically could be done to help businesses avoid making those errors in the first place? Actually, HMRC was more willing to engage with small, with small businesses. At the moment, there is a very distinction between the way HMRC deal with large businesses and small businesses. Large businesses are allocated a, a customer a relationship manager, which is, which I, and I don't question the, theory, the reason for this at all. So, of course, the large businesses, if they, if they have a VAT issue, they have a contact with an HMRC and then go along and discuss it. Now, small business, businesses, if they actually want to engage with HMRC to actually obtain advice or reassurance from HMRC, they have a, have a number of op options. One is actually to bring the National Advice Service, which they do, and that National Advice Service normally will guide them to the information which is available on the website. And HMRC's policy, as I think we quoted in, 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 our, in our submission, in fact, is to encourage people to actually find the information on, on, on their website, and that should be sufficient for them to answer their query. Now, if, if, you, if, if you actually want to take it further as a small business and you want a qu clear, reliable um, ruling from HMRC in writing, you have to make, take, make use of their statutory, non statutory clearance procedures, which you write, write to them, give them all the information, set out all the facts uh, about um, the, the material which you've, which you've looked at, and if they agree, there is uncertainty, they will give you a ruling. Now, that sounds, sounds very, a very, you know, good service, but if I can just give you some statistics, some HMRC statistics, which actually give an insight into that service. So if I want, want a, a, a ruling or a clearance from HMRC in writing that I can rely on, I write to their non statutory clearance team. Now, we have about two and a half million VAT registered businesses at the moment. Over 2 million of those, 2.2 million are probably SMEs and micro-businesses, and they have to use this system because they don't have a customer relationship manager. So we have two, 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 over 2 million businesses which could use this procedure. And I asked HMRC for the statistics on how many applications they receive per annum, and they willingly gave them to me, which I'm grateful for. <laughs> in 2000, in the, in, let me get this right. In the year to March 2017, they received a total of 688 applications from, that's all. In that year, right, in the following year, in the year to March 2018, they had 544. Now, and then you've got to look a little bit deeper to see how useful of that. Of those clearances, about, in about 50% of the cases, they refused to give a positive ruling a positive sort of decision. Instead of that, this, this, their, their, their response is, we would take the person to the, to the piece or the, the section in our guidance which gives them the answer. Because they said we're not there to, to actually provide comfort letters. Now, what is comfort for one is, is an uncertainty for, the, for, for another. <laughs> I want to see a much more uh, interactive approach to uh, their dealings with small businesses. And what I would say to you is really, what, what, I mean, our point is that dealing with our members, and I was at a, a CIT course 
a, a tax course recently where one of the speakers on VAT was, was a, a, a corporate lawyer from Lincoln's Inns who had actually written to HMRC using this procedure because he was dealing with, with a transfer of going concern. I know no more about it than that. And the response he got was, sorry, we don't have to give a ruling. The answer is in our, it's in our guidance. Now, can I just make one point? Because the whole point is, we, we as professionals say so that, that, that system is not used because it, is, it doesn't suit the customer's needs. HMRC may come along and say, well, it's not being used because they don't, don't need it. But that's not, not, not so. I, I, I guess the point about the is a self-assessed yeah. tax. Mm -hmm. And that's wonderful uh, from the tax administration's point of view because every business per person is their own tax co collector. But it does mean that it's very important to have proper guidance. Yeah. Sufficiently uh, welcoming approach to those who genuinely do have queries. Yeah. 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 Uh, just, sorry, sorry, I just want to. Uh, I'm conscious that time is a, is a pressing issue. We have got the Making Tax Digital initiative, which is, uh, we are told, going to make a big difference to uh, the ease of making sure we avoid error. The pilot for this started in April. Uh, Ms. Rawson, do you have any feedback at this point about? early impressions about whether it's making a difference we, um, the, the pilot. My understanding is that the pilot is still very limited in size. Um, we're talking to probably tens of businesses rather than hundreds, um, and it is still in a private phase. So we don't actually have any direct feedback from HMRC in it at the moment on that pilot. I understand that I think the first returns have been filed under Making Tax Digital. Uh, the one point I would make about Making Tax Digital in terms of errors is that earlier I referred to the fact that that figure that we have for the errors in VAT returns encompasses a whole range of different kinds of errors. Whilst making tax digital will address things like errors in record keeping or transpositional errors or you know manual errors mm, like that, mm. it's not going to address if people were wrongly classifying a supply before making tax digital, they're still going to be doing that with making tax digital. That's not going to be impacted. So it's quite hard to say how much of an impact making tax digital is going to have on that figure mm. without knowing how, what makes it up. Have you seen anything at all in the pilot so far that will help businesses then? Um, I think the record keeping elements will help in terms of those errors around, you know, if people are not keeping their records correctly or they're making errors when transferring things from one spreadsheet to another or when completing things for the tax VAT return. Mm. Um, so that aspect I think will help. Um, in terms of other ideas, I'm not certain. There was talk at the time when it was first muted MTD about having nudges and prompts built in mm -hmm. so that there would be sort of feedback from HMRC to say something along the lines of Have I'm they sure that's in? right. To my understanding is no, they're not mm -hmm. at this stage. Right. Uh, the BCC have released some pretty concerning figures <coughs> showing that 24% of businesses haven't even heard of making touch digital and 66% only know it by name or have very slight detail. Is there a danger uh, that without sufficient preparation by business that we end up making the situation inadvertently worse, Mr Lyons, would you say? There's, there's definitely concern, I think, and, and that 24% figure didn't particularly surprise me. Uh, we've been doing quite a lot of work with our members to raise awareness amongst them, but even amongst the, the sort of agent community, there's still a lack of knowledge of what they need to do practically. And that is hampered by the fact, as I said earlier, the pilot's still in very early stages. There's no publicly available information as to what software will work for VAT for MTD. Uh, my understanding is HMRC are going to bring that out once they've moved into a public phase of the trial. Right. So at the moment we are telling our members that they need to start getting software in and to get ready, but we can't tell them exactly which software to do or what practical steps to take, which is sort of mm. hampering us slightly. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a very British expression, hampering slightly. A significant yeah. understatement. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is significantly suboptimal. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm translating what our members say into yeah. slightly more political terms yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, you know. So, yeah, and the problem I think with the, <laughs> the wider population outside of the agents, so HMRC have been doing quite a lot with the agents, mm. there's been some publications, there's been webinars, but to my knowledge, they haven't done any direct communication with businesses. And as Daniel, I think, mentioned earlier, that's a self administered tax, and a lot of businesses do it in-house still. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is also a sort of untapped you know, section of business that are really not going to be prepared for this, because you mm. know, if you don't have an agent telling you to get ready, they're not getting ready. MTD on its own won't close back. Up. No, it won't, no. 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 One final question from me, Mr Lyons. In your written evidence to this committee, you mentioned that the use of an application programming interface, which is a nice user-friendly term, between <laughs> traders and HMRC will help avoid clerical transposition errors. Is it fair to say that other than preventing those relatively simple errors, you see little in making tax digital that would actually help to prevent meaningful errors in VAT returns? I 
give a very short answer. Um, yeah, I don't think it'll make an enormous amount of difference. I, I, I think the transpositional er errors are a very small part of the whole. As, as Emma said, it's the technical judgment issues where people are making er errors. The, the one point I would also make about errors is errors can work both ways. So just because an error is being made, it doesn't necessarily mean that less tax is being paid. It could be that tax is being paid that doesn't yeah. need to be. Yeah. Yeah. I had, I had an experience of this actually. Um, uh, in my own business, um, I had a I discovered a bug in a major piece of accounting software in relation to sales to mail order customers within the EU who weren't, weren't VAT registered. And it actually incorrectly produced VAT returns. Mm. I then, when I discovered the error, which caused us a huge unexpected bill, I tried to find out if HMRC endorsed or. In, or or inspected or made sure that these pieces of software worked. And to my amazement, they don't. They don't do it on VAT software. They do do it on employee and PAYE software. And I couldn't believe that actually their attitude to me was, it's your problem. It depends what software you're using. Because I assumed that a major brand of accountancy mm -hmm. software would have been checked. So if that's going to be repeated on this thing, then everyone who uses it will be responsible for the, the error. It will be. Yeah. Uh, Cautionary. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got a supplementary on this, yeah. yeah I wanted just to um, ask a very quick question about making tax digital, because there has been a lot of concern expressed, um, certainly by the North East Chambers of Commerce, that businesses just are not ready for this. And just since, you know, I touched upon Brexit earlier, um, I don't think the two are unrelated in the sense that there is an awful lot of uncertainty, there is an awful lot of change for small businesses and one thing that the Chamber seem to be calling for is for the full rollout to be rolled back in order to give more time for businesses. I mean they produced um, some quite uh, worrying figures, 24% have never heard of making tax digital and only 10% seem to have the details. Um, do you have thoughts on that suggestion? Yeah. Uh, talk about my experience last week at a, at a client's, uh, a West Country and a, and a firm. Um, and the one thing that the, the bookkeeper raised with me was what she should do about making tax digital. Because she'd been in touch with their, their soft, their, the, the software firm providing the accountancy package. And they didn't didn't know. They said, "Ask a tax tax advisor." Mm -hmm. And I said, "Well, I don't know. You better go and ask him." <laughs> <laughs> there isn't just isn't enough information no, at the moment uh, to, be able, to act upon. <laughs> and I think you're right. There's an un unfortunate juxtaposition that um, April 19 is also when making tax digital is coming into effect. So, um, yeah, I think there is a real lack of awareness among small businesses out there um, that needs to be addressed. And we are doing, and the professional bodies are doing as much as we can to get our members prepared and get them ready, and then they feed down to their clients. But as I say, there is a section that I worry about that are the unrepresented taxpayers mm. who are going to have to deal with this who yeah. don't have that, um, that advice. But to be completely fair to HMRC, they have said that for the first, I think, 12 months, there'll be what they call a soft landing, where they'll take a reasonable view on penalties. Yeah, which is going to be needed. <laughs> 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 a reasonable view on penalties it sounds like someone from the World Cup, but there we are. Right? Um, no, no, exactly. <laughs> Alison. There's, there's no situation in politics for which a football analogy is not appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've just got some um, further questions on um, just some of the, some of the practicalities. Um, all of you um, in evidence talked about um, the way that... Uh, tax rules connect with Parliament um, and I just wanted to clarify whether you think it's fair to say that even for fairly everyday transactions um, it would be very difficult for business to navigate its way around the VAT rules with reference solely to the legislation. To the legislation certainly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so do you think that businesses, when it comes to VAT, have to re rely much more on guidance than, yeah. say, for example, income tax or public? Yeah, they, they, most businesses, I would say, never look at the black yeah. law legislation. They look, at, um, they look at HMRC guidance or they look at HMRC manuals, which are published online. They, they very rarely look at the law. And the problem with guidance is it does get out of date. Uh, and it can be incomplete and the CIOT and the ATT have been doing large projects along with HMRC of identifying that guidance mm. that's inadequate. It, 
is not just that it gets out of date. It can be interpreted in two different, in different ways by different people. You know, you might, and I've seen examples of it, in fact, where people have read the guidance and come to different, two reasonably minded people, as the courts would have it, and come to different conclusion looking at the same information. <laughs> okay, and so just to turn to the non-statutory um, clearance process, um, is that just another layer of process that makes up for the lack of clarity? clarity in the oh, it should help with clarity. It should give people, small businesses certainty. They should be the right for that. And setting up the facts and this is what we're doing and this is what we, how we think we should account for VAT. And they would expect HMRC to write back and say, yes, you're doing it correctly. What HMRC won't do is to write back and say you're doing, doing it correctly. They write back and say, well, if what you should do is explain in our guidance, or they write back and say, back and say whether, whether there's a. Well, I'm not quite. I've got the stage. I'm not quite sure what HR mean, HMRC mean by when there's clear and uncertainty. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. and I'm really? not clear. That's a bit of an ambiguous. But when they, 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 when they, there's definite un uncertainty. And I'm quite it's an uncertainty. It's certain uncertainty. Yes. We tend to pass the um, the letter round to see if people decide is it a yes or no because sometimes it can be quite delphic. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yes, um, is there any other tactics that, that people employ to unfathom HMRC's letters? Well, lots of people would like to have often face-to-face -face meetings, I think, yes. with HMRC, because that is often the quickest way to reach an agreement on something that's not a black and white issue, a yes or no issue. Um, but they're finding it increasingly more difficult to get that, to get yeah. HMRC to agree to yes. meet. HMRC have got a demographic challenge, or a, a very large proportion of officers are over 50 yeah. and uh, in five, ten years time there are even fewer people who have experienced deep technical knowledge of VAT and I know they're trying, trying to recruit now but it's quite hard to find an experienced technical officer. But it's actually difficult to actually speak to one, yes. Yeah. Yeah. either, yeah. either you know, across a table like this or even on the telephone. No? Yeah. Um, just say a bit more about that, what do you think, what, why, why wouldn't people want to go and be technical officers? Why wouldn't, they? why wouldn't they want? To, why wouldn't people want to do that job? Um, it's, I, I don't know really. I mean, I, I, I suppose you, you know most people from the outside who aren't involved in the world of tax and VAT probably think it's quite dull. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my, my children do. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful. My experience was I worked in the freight industry for ten years, and when I met customs people, then I felt that they had come from an industry that I understood. When I was in online retail. I was meeting people at HMRC and I felt they didn't have any real background or understanding of, on, of, of this whole new kind of uh, business area. Um, I think it's yeah. fair to say there's not much movement from industry into HMRC. There's probably more movement the other, the other way. Yeah. But, but actually, having, having worked as a VAT inspector a long time ago, no, no, it can be an in ta it can be tax. First of all, tax could be interesting and fun, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Dealing with small business. Committee, we all think taxes. Let me just, um, you've all alluded to this, but I just want to kind of get it clear on, and on the record. It seems like what we're saying is it's easier for larger businesses to get advice from HMRC without necessarily becoming involved in a dispute, whereas for smaller businesses, that's harder. That's what we're saying, that's isn't it? it is. Yeah. 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 Yes. It is. Okay. Um, and. Um, Mr. Lyons, I just wanted to specifically ask you um, that in your evidence you mentioned the um, alternative dispute resolution mm. means that you can get the right technical specialist mm. to look at an issue. So presumably that implies that you can't get that um, specialist advice from the word go. Like, no, you sometimes end up with a technical position where you're entrenched on, on both sides and by going down the ADR route you can get everybody in the room uh, you can get the right technical policy people from HMRC, not the people on the front line, and you can have a conversation about the underlying technical issues, and you can, uh, many times you can reach an so answer. there's a quality issue? Y yes, there's a quality. It, it's, more about, it's more about making sure HMRC take this dispute seriously and get the right people in the room, because if not, you end up in a situation where you have to troop off to court, and that takes a long time, costs a lot of money for both sides. Helpful. Um, Mr Allen, um, you say in your evidence that um, VAT policy is made without... Uh, by HMRC without reference to Parliament, which comes mm. back to this issue of whether or not the law is, is sufficient. Um, do you think that that means that HMRC doesn't really report to ministers or to Parliament about whether VAT policy is actually working as, as we might have intended it to? Well, I think the problem at the moment, 
is the, the, the situation you have at the moment is people forget that the whole of the VAT system is based upon higher EU law. Um, and the parts of EU law that you don't see are not written into the statute book in this country. So, for instance, the, the kind of, the kind of um, thinking behind the way the VAT system operates is, is a very high esoteric level there. And there seems to be an area, and the Channel Islands was an example of it, where um, HMRC were applying the, the law as it stood in the statute book, but weren't looking at the higher level part of it. Um, now, I think what concerns would concern me and members of RAVAS would be if something like that came up in the future and we were outside of the EU, based upon the experience I had, if you go to HMRC, it's a dead end. We had the advantage of going to the Commission. Now, I'm, I, this isn't a political point I'm making, but it would be good if there was some separate part sort of organisation that oversaw HMRC on those kind of higher level issues so you at least had some second opinion you could go to because if we hadn't had that we would have pretty much been dead in the water. Could I make a slightly controversial point? I, I am not sure to what degree parliamentarians read all the secondary legislation that's, that's laid. Yes. Yes. No. <laughs> That, I, 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 I feel that uh, you're probably missing out on, on uh, quite a lot of detail. You, you know, you might look at the primary legislation when it goes through in the, the finance bill, but the secondary legislation, where a lot of the detail is, where a lot of the problems and challenges are, uh, most of it probably negative resolution, there's no debate, it and just becomes law. And that is different to other taxes in that respect. So many of the direct taxes, most of the detail is in the primary legislation. Mm. In that, most of it is secondary or even in the tertiary in the notices. I always make a distinction with that, really. With, it, really. with direct tax, you've actually got two parties involved. You've got the HMRC, the tax collector, and, and the business, or the taxpayer. Trouble with VAT disputes, you've often got three parties involved. On one, on, on a particular, it's a transactional tax, and on that transaction, you can have three different points of view. You can have the view of the seller, the buyer, and HMRC. Unless you get them all singing from the same, song, the same hymn sheet, you have, you have difficulties. Okay. I've just got two very um, brief questions uh, to finish. Um, you'll be pleased to know that the first of those is about Jaffa Cakes. Um, uh, there aren't any. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a cake or confection. Exactly. All, it's a, it's a, a, an example uh, that all philosophy students know well because it's uh, used to dis describe whether or not something is a thing because of what you call it. Um, but, you know, the Jaffa Cake um, uh, issue is the classic example of some of the um, boundary and, and, and definitional issues that arise um, in VAT. So could you just say for the record why you think it's, why each of you thinks it's um, such a complicated exercise to categorise? Because, because we, over the last 45 years or so since we've had VAT in the UK, this is not a European complication. This is homegrown. A lot of the rules, the reason that, uh, that chocolate milkshake pow pow powder is zero rated and strawberry is not, because they rely on the old purchase tax rules. And there was some move towards <laughs> providing a special treatment of hot uh, chocolate at the end of the Second World War. So there are lots of social reasons why we've got these various distinctions. But the complexity has become so great now, I think we really just need to start again. Pasty tax was the other one. Because actually, what that was trying to do was correct the unfairness where chip shops were getting charged VAT and a high street uh, hot food seller wasn't. But the way it was sold was that people were being unfairly taxed on pasties, when in fact the reverse was actually true. <laughs> yeah. I actually sat in on a lot of those discussions about pasty tax, and in fact, and I must, I could have brag about this. In fact, if you read the ATT submission on capacity tax, HMRC largely followed our, our suggestion on, on the capacity tax. <laughs> so, were you, so you were to blame for the Omni <laughs> Shambles budget? Is that what you're saying? Uh, particularly in one discussion with HMRC, I sat in really, the distinction was how do you distinguish between hot food and cold food? Cold takeaway food should be zero rated. Hot food should be allowed at 20% fat. And we had one HMRC official said, well, we, all we want to know, if it's hot, if it's above the ambient temperature. Mm. How do you know if it's above the ambient te temperature? We won't be very too hard on it, but if you touch it with your finger <laughs> and it's hot, that's above the ambient temperature. And I sat there thinking, do I want my pasty touch? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay, Charles, got one, have you got a question on that? I'm yeah, going to bring yeah, answer. Yeah, on that point, uh, 
when I was a practitioner, I had uh, a, an organisation like Subway that would heat the, uh, heat, heat the food uh, on bread and then serve it to the customer. And at the time they served it to the customer, it was not above ambient room temperature. And I had a whole row with the VAT authorities because uh, it should be zero rated. And we won. The solution we came, <laughs> the solution we came, came to really is, is that if food is hot because it's been freshly cooked and it's cooling because it's been freshly cooked, then if it's a zero-rated product, it'll be zero-rated. If you have any attempt to retard the cooling process or to keep it heated or to heat it, therefore you charge VAT. Which, yeah. So, difference. I'm, I'm going to double-pass this, okay? <laughs> Alison, we've got a final question. Yeah. No, my, no, my final question is, because in the end, we can all sort of, like, laugh and joke about Jaffa cakes and pasties. Um, as, as you said, Mr Lyons, it really, this is, these are some underlying social things, some of which are outdated, some of which are not. Who knows? Um, but my uh, guesstimation would be, actually, these are not substantial uh, changes in terms of the tax base. So, to finish on a more productive <coughs> note, um, if each of you could say what, your, what the top of your to-do list would be in terms of securing the VAT tax base. Well, my, 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 my top of to-do list would be sure that, um, because we're dealing with it, I'm going to stick to the, uh, the small business sector, because that's, that's, that's our client base, is to ensure that they, they make fewer errors, I don't know what sort of errors they make. You make errors, you know, you, you do make it. And in fact, they get better help and assistance from HMRC to be sure they don't make those errors in the first place. <laughs> I would have uh, more fully trained VAT inspectors mm. and better education for taxpayers. Um, mine would be specifically, obviously, to do with retailers. It would be um, ensure that online retailer, retail platforms are responsible for uh, the VAT if it's not paid and are collecting the VAT and then that the problem solved basically. Thank you. Well, look, thank you very much indeed for your very uh, constructive and concise um, and very helpful evidence uh, this morning, which I think has got our inquiry off to a very good uh, start. We're really grateful to you for giving your time, preparing for the session and for being here with us uh, this morning. Thank you very much indeed. The proceeding has ended.